the demographics in the room and the large number of white male keynotes. Like there's something to be in that room. I couldn't be complicit in normalizing this behavior of what I was seeing around me. And so I like went home uh, and was like, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And uh, decided to launch Women in Voice a month afterwards. That, so that was August, 2018 and the rest is history. Now we have 10 chapters internationally in seven countries and I think three in beta. Seattle, some talking about London and Madrid, just a huge international community talking about gender diversity in voice tech. Celebrate, amplify, empower is all what it's about. Today I'm joined by Dr. Joan Palmiter Bajoric. Welcome to the Sound and Marketing Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. So let's just kind of start off with, can you introduce yourself and what you do and tell us a little bit about Women in Voice and what that's all about? Sure. I am the head of conversational research at Versa. Um, I'm also the founder and CEO of Women in Voice, which is an international empowerment organization. I'm based in Seattle um, and Versa is based in, there are headquarters is in Melbourne, Australia. Versa is a, the largest digital voice agency in the world. Um, we have, I think, almost 70 headcount. Oh, and if you hear the noises behind me, excuse me, I'm in my WeWork office. Oh, got it. Uh, <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur in residence here at WeWork Labs. So uh, Versa is phenomenal. My CEO um, helped recruit me. She, her name is Kath Blackham. She's just a powerhouse and really an innovative thinker. I'm on the Startup Innovation International Expansion arm. Um, Versa is known not only for amazing work with Domino's and Huggies and recently Coca-Cola, but we have a four-day work week, a distributed team, flexible hours. I mean, it's like, you know, I get to work in 2020. That's, that's Versa. So I'm the part of the first three hires here in Seattle. And so I guess Women in Voice came first because you founded that in 2018? That's correct. And what was your, your inspiration? What was your motivation for doing so? Let's see, 2018. That feels like so long ago. <laughs> um, so um, I have a PhD in the field of speech language technology. I'm a linguist. I'm a researcher. I was getting my PhD at the University of Arizona and starting. So I, I think a lot about multilingualism and multimodal and kind of the future of voice integrated into everything. Um, and I was presenting my PhD research domestically and internationally at academic conferences and then at tech conferences. Um, so I spoke at the first voice summit back in 2018 in um, Newark, New Jersey. So I went there and literally I was presenting the same research, right? Um, but the demographics in the room and the large number of white male keynotes, mm. just like, uh, I've seen Silicon Valley, you know, the HBO show, but like there's something to be in that room. I, I was just, I, <laughs> the phrase I used was like, I couldn't be complicit in normalizing this behavior <sighs> of what I was seeing around me. And so I like went home uh, and was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Um, of course, like in my parents' basement and uh, decided to launch Women in Voice a month afterwards. That, so that was August, 2018 and the rest is history. Now we have 10 chapters internationally in seven countries and I think three in beta. So I'm talking about London and Madrid, Seattle. I'm going to forget uh, if I can name all of them really fast. Um, but just huge international community talking about gender diversity in voice tech. Celebrate, amplify, empower is all what it's about. I like that. Celebrate, amplify, and empower. I love that. Yeah. And I think that, that that's good for, I mean, yes, women, but I, I think just any anybody that doesn't have a representation of themselves out there to look at, I think that's so, so important. Um, I have, just for an example, I have uh, a bunch of Korean friends that um, they got so excited when... Um, Par Parasite, when Parasite just like mm -hmm. cleaned up at the Oscars because they, they didn't have a representation of themselves to like, you know, strive towards. Like it was just, they, yeah. So anyways, I, I think that's really well, great. Well, I think that's um, related to <laughs> women in voice. We talk a lot about intersectional feminism, which is just, you know, big jargony words, but talking about the intersection of where you're coming from and the privilege you bring to the room. Mm -hmm. And I think Similarly to your story about your Asian friends, one of my friends is Latino and he came to me and he's like, I love Women in Voice. Women in Voice is awesome. Mm. But I'm, I'm also a Latino in voice and 
I'm othered in other ways. Mm. And, and so I was, what I said to him is I'm an ally to you and you can be an ally to me, right? We can support each other in different ways. And I hope that's a narrative that everyone can, can I, I have this narrative of like, join the party. Like mm. we, we see the world in such a, a new fun way. And I really hope that I, I do see change. I don't know if you see change, but uh, last year I was pinged by two very senior hiring managers who were like coming to consciousness and saying like, I'm about to hire someone and there are no women on the list. Mm. Not a single one is a finalist candidate for this super senior role. Joan, what should I do? It's like, oh, wow, I can't fix the system, but I'm so glad you're coming to these realizations. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's the first step. I mean, because until you realize you can't really be searching for the diversity. Like if you don't realize that there is no diversity, because that's a real thing too, that you just don't realize that the whole room is white, (laughs) you know, or it's all male. Um, I think uh, I, I am seeing change definitely. I'm a... Um, composer and songwriter and everything like that. And, you know, when I graduated college in 2003, um, I was the only female that graduated with a composition degree uh, at a very small school, but I was the only female. Oh, yeah. And then, um, you know, for composition and everything like that, uh, I had a handful of women that, you know, I associated with that I, uh, you know, I wanted to aim that that level but really it was the male perspective for composers for a long time and now like with uh, I'm going to say her last name wrong so I'm not going to say it but with Hilder winning best score at the Oscars again the Oscars um, for Joker that was so empowering that was so cool to see and I was even excited for Parasite which I will never see that movie because I can't watch horror movies but (laughs) um, I was so excited to see that because that they, they were not expected to win I don't even think one of them and they they just cleaned up it was insane so i think definitely there is change happening um and i i don't think that we should be worried about the speed of the change Mm. but applauding it and going cool because i don't want to you know elect a woman to something and i disagree with what she stands for you shouldn't you shouldn't like want a woman to get ahead just because she's a woman you should want them to get ahead because you agree with where they're coming from and that they are the right person for the job i think this narrative of speed and sustainability is something i think about all the time is it a win in the uh something about this phrase about winning the battle winning the battle versus winning the war Mm. And I think, I don't know, we, we actually have a, a branding guide. I'm not supposed to, military is not one of the ones we support um, here at Women in Voice. But I think thinking about the short-term versus long-term sustainability, I have very raw conversations with my peers and mentees here at Women in Voice. And we talk about burnout and taking high impact roles or opportunities. But also, does that mean that you might be incapacitated in six months and not be able to participate for Mm. what the next five years look like. Mm -hmm. And so I think really, I think about in our workplaces, not only hiring, but retaining diverse talent um, and kind of what inclusion really, really means is a a constant, anyway, sustainability in, in multiple respects is something I deeply think about. In a previous episode, I spoke with um, Bob Stolzberg of Voice XP, and he was a huge advocate for mm. the Women in Voice organization. Um, he couldn't say enough nice things about what was going on. And he his opinion was very sided towards that he thinks that uh, Women in Voice just makes sense to have uh, women telling the narrative. Uh, it's a more relatable um, association and that they generally are better storytellers. What's your take? Well, first of all, I mean, Bob is such an advocate and that's extremely sweet of him. We, we love allies who are wildly enthusiastic. Um, I don't know that one gender is any better at any one thing. I know many phenomenal female um, designers in the conversational space, but I, I can't. All boys are better at math. All girls are better at looking pretty. Mm-hmm we are socialized in many ways. What is based on our genetics? People dream of what our futures will be before we're even born. I'm extremely excited about a world where we don't potentially think in those ways. I I really, I I talk a lot about how (laughs) uh, wildly creative, brilliant work and ideas do not come from a homogenous population. And I really think that having lots of different 
perspectives in the door on both design and dev and marketing across the board build cooler projects that are more disruptive to our current day to day. That's an interesting um, perspective. I, I really like to hear that. I agree. I, I don't think that I think we've come a long way from the book, uh, Women Are, what was it, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From <laughs> Venus. <laughs> and because uh, I hate that too. I, I feel like um, me and my husband, when I hear about like husband and wife dynamics and they say, oh yeah, and the wife is this way and the husband is this way. I'm like, um, it's kind of flipped in our situation for this. Like that doesn't sound like us at all or um, that's what he would do instead of me. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much... I don't like to be pegged. Well, I honestly (laughs) think that the, well, the way the LGBT community has really talked about um, different gendered spaces in partnerships and couples, like the, I don't know if you've seen Queer Eye recently, the new relaunch, Mm -mm. it's phenomenal, strongly recommend. Mm -mm. Um, Well, one of the participants says like, oh, are you the man or the woman in the couple of this, um, you know, Mm. male couple? And they say, pause, like we don't have to fit into those default boxes. You know, like Mm -hmm. the woman box, the man box. I think that's a a different framework um, for thinking about what gender does and doesn't mean today and in the future. So, um, I mean, you've also talked about having, you know, representation, that there should be representation of like all different dynamics and genders. And how do we go about, in your opinion, because this (laughs) is totally an opinion, how would we go about doing that without... um, making sure that we have the the black guy and the white girl and the Asian man and like how do how do we go about getting that diversification uh like when we don't have it you know how do we get the diversification of females when females aren't applying for the job oh gosh that has like such a multifaceted thing I know I I launched women in voice but I'm not um, an expert in gender studies per se I'm learning daily all the time um I definitely do see what you're seeing of here's the black face, here's the white face, here's the Asian face on promo material. I think I'm seeing this more and more Mm -hmm. of like, we need to slot someone in. Um, I feel like I notice when the the organizers and PR are thinking through it and when they're not, um, especially a lot of people send me screenshots of different things being like, did you see this? Like they actually tried or... Uh, you have to scroll to page three before you see an Asian face or, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people um, are having these dialogues inside their heads or with their friends, um, very kind of closed, safe spaces. Um, I don't know if I specifically answered your question. It's a big question. I'm I'm not sure either. (laughs) I think it's, I think it's just like kind of a you know, something to think about. Like I'm thinking about it. I hope that people who are listening are thinking about it. I don't think there's an answer. Um, But I I do see that sometimes, like you said, you can kind of tell, tell when they're being thoughtful of it and when they're just trying to be tactful or tactile, tactical. There you go. Tactical about it. (laughs) I really think it's a, it takes all of us in micro and macro interactions. I I think especially about when I think about diversity myself and who I, and who I'm advocating to get interviews for. I'm really trying to shape my ecosystems. And, uh, you know, there's only so much time in a day and really thinking through, did I go the extra mile with different candidates? Um, and really try, because the, the short, the little, the little choices we make today pin out huge for who ends up in those senior positions and eventually those C-suites or founding their own companies and who gets the funding for these, you know, beautiful startups. I mean, I think we really... I talk about the idea of like we vote with our feet and I think we also vote with our time. You just touched on something that I, I didn't put in the talking notes, but it actually would be an interesting transit. Um, but uh, you, you talked about funding for startups uh, and I've, I've read some, some research about this and it's just women are not, women led startups are still getting like a tiny, tiny percentage Less of than 3% the capital funding and mm-hmm. yeah, it's something really, really yeah. low. And I wonder like, will that just naturally progress forward or are there things that we can do to, um, you know, put those, those opportunities more forefront? Well, I mean, 3% is not a satisfactory number in the slightest. And I'd also say, I think that 3% is mostly um, white women, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I would like to plug my friends, the Female Founders Alliance here in Seattle, who are doing phenomenal work in this space um, to really think about what are the barriers to even getting in the door. So many of these are intros to be able to pitch top VCs. Uh, am I seeing movement in this space? Not as much as I wish I were, but I think what's really cool is when I see um, like at Founders Live, people pitching in rooms and who gets on stage and when women do pitch, I feel like the barrier, they're so confident and they're so prepared and they have their numbers and they've honed their pitch. I mean, I'm deeply impressed um, by the women I see around me who are trailblazing. Um, and I also see women at VCs and VCs trying to be more thoughtful about who they're funding and the percentages in their own portfolios. I'm extremely hopeful, but I, 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 like, like we're saying, 3% is um, deeply embarrassing. Agreed. And I think that that was about where the percentage of female uh, film scorers mm. were. <laughs> mm. I think it went up maybe to 12 percent, but I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> but there's been there's been some a little bit more push in that direction in the past couple of years. Yeah, That's good. And I, I'm Women in voice. It is extremely a common narrative for people to say I'm the only woman on my team. Um, but like across teams, I actually call it the Eleanor Rigsby syndrome, all the lonely people, because sadly we are all alone. But um, I saw an interaction at a Women of Voice Seattle event where two women who work a few buildings apart were like, you're the only woman on your team. I'm the only woman on my team. Like, let's be friends. Um, and I think that's the power of community in and of itself. But I think Oh, it's depressing. It's depressing. And can't we make our own teams? I mean, literally, that's one of the things I think about um, with women and boys is I'm surrounded by wildly talented people. Like, can I get them a job? Can I hire them in the next few years? Um, the, the talent pool is undeniable. So I, you know, we're just finding glass ceilings and un, unpleasant work environments. And again, voting with our feet on what works. I think that um, also just culture in general changing and how, like like I was just saying about like seeing representation, even if it's a small amount, but we're starting to see representation of what we want to strive towards in front of us. And we never had that before. And, you know, for, you know, I'm, I'm almost 39 and it's just been recently that the, the dynamic or the, the conversation has kind of stopped going towards well you know you're gonna get married and you're gonna have kids I did that but um <laughs> but like there's there's a path that you take and um you just kind of go with it I don't know oh, yeah. I, I guess well, I'm kind I of make jokes all the time I find or I'm a, I'm a total jokester excuse me but like I find <laughs> uh there is that set narrative and if people want to live it out like props to them but they hopefully know that they have options I mean, I make jokes all the time. Like if I were born in a different generation, um, I'd already be a housewife by now, you know? Uh, <laughs> like there's different, instead of being a extremely happy uh, researcher and um, community builder, right? Like there's these different, we, we have different options. And I think opening up the space, this is actually something like people holding themselves back or opening up spaces to pursue different things. Um, I, I see people, as you, I think you mentioned briefly, who is applying to certain things, mm -hmm. people potentially holding themselves back, not projecting themselves, not thinking there's a place for them because they may, maybe don't see themselves yet there or what the words say matching up with how they feel and where they are in their career. I recently, it was so, so sad recently, um, one of my colleagues, I keep teasing her like, you're going to <laughs> you're a next CTO. And she didn't apply to a recent CTO position at a startup, mm -hmm. but the man who is now the CTO there has less experience than she does. Mm. And I asked her, I was like, did you notice that this, you know, he got the CTO position? She's like, him? And I was like, yeah, you didn't choose to apply. Like you, you mm -hmm. chose, like she didn't think she was quote unquote ready, which could be for many, many factors, but at least in the technical chops, she's being leapfrogged mm -hmm. because she doesn't believe in herself. And that is just heartbreaking to me. Anyway, I'm hoping <laughs> with this consciousness of uh, raising um, that I can help support her, um, you know, build that confidence um, with private and um, public community and uh, 
hopefully to get her into the next CTO position that's a good fit. I think that's a large part of it because I've I've had that in my own experience is that I I didn't have the faith in myself Mm -hmm. or I just if you doubt yourself just a little bit (laughs) that'll take you a long way of nothing Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and so I think I've held myself back as well just you know assuming oh well you know I I spent a lot of my time before I actually focused towards the creative in admin. And Mm -hmm. so I was always like serving others and I was helping other people achieve their dreams. And I had this moment where, and I won't get into it, but it was like this, a come to Jesus moment where I was just like, what am I doing? I'm working so hard to fulfill this other person's vision and dream and passion. And what am I doing with mine? Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was just, it was so weird that I hadn't thought about it. And then I just all of a sudden thought about it. And I was like, I got to stop doing this. Yeah. And it took years, you know, to to get out of that mentality, that mindset of like shutting yourself down. The imposter syndrome for sure is a part of it. And Well, and this is how we're socialized to do it, sadly. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, self-sacrifice, I'm not worthy. You know, I'll, I'll support other people's goals. I'll mm-hmm. make other people feel good. Um, mm-hmm. Ironically, ironically, this came to uh, fruition when I was working for a female executive. <laughs> oh, well, and that's, I think, what was really frightening last year. Um, I realized that there were three senior women holding me back. Uh, just, mm. just because they're women, unfortunately, does not mean they're your ally. Um, is also just difficult to, to process for me. Um, but allies can come from so many different directions, but yeah, I mean, holding yourself back. I mean, goodness knows, free, free yourself, <laughs> a lot, give yourself the space and time to pursue what, you know, brings you joy and you're very passionate about. And, um, honestly, I've had the opposite problem where people are like, Ooh, you know, you're too confident, Icarus, you will fall. Um, mm. how, how dare you think that you belong in these spaces, especially I I get all the time, like ageism, sexism, like you are so young, you don't belong here. You you couldn't possibly know what you're talking about, but I do have the technical chops. I don't question myself. Eventually I'll have gray hair and and (laughs) people will then, you know, ageism the other way. Uh, But hopefully we can find people who respect us just for being a human. And I think those interactions, you can, you can feel it. It's different. Yeah. I wonder if even like, uh, thinking about like diversification it's not necessarily that women need to be represented but it could be the the woman who didn't speak up needs to be represented because because she's been so quiet or she's been going this direction that she thought she should go that she's seeing from a different perspective something that needs to be voiced out loud Mm -hmm. and so by putting her on center stage or you know giving her a voice Mm -hmm. (laughs) um you're gonna get a different story and, and just something that needs to be said. So it's not necessarily her gender, but the fact that she has been quiet and, and yeah. hasn't been represented. And that's represented. And, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Of course. No, I don't need fine. to cut you off. But I certainly do this in meetings when I notice women not speaking. Um, I was at a think tank last week and I there were about 30% women in the room and there are two women at my table, but I was the only one speaking at my table, <laughs> you know, when you're the only woman speaking. And I asked for them to participate or I asked them questions, trying to get them to uh, speak up because it is extremely difficult to, you know, there are very few women and I'm the only woman speaking because, you know, I'm a, an extrovert chatterbox. Opening up that opportunity, specifically asking them because sometimes uh, well, and, and they could be an introvert and otherwise, but usually I think it's because they're socialized to be in that listening, patient, other people on stage kind of mentality, um, which mm-hmm. I'm really hoping that we can support each other to create those safe spaces. And again, with the, you know, celebrate, amplify, empower, uh, you know, hear those voices and hear different perspectives. It isn't just about women in voice and women having a voice. It's that we should be mindful and strive to include all voices that are not currently being heard or represented. Sometimes that is from someone who is not strong enough or confident enough in themselves yet that needs someone to lift them up and carry them to the mic. It is our responsibility to help them share their story. We live in this world together, so let's help the earth keep spinning. Lift up your fellow man and woman. Tune in next week for the conclusion of my interview with Dr. Joan Palminer-Bajoric, where we get more in-depth into the pulse of women in the voice industry. 
We'll talk about allyship and what that means for the inclusion of all invoice, contributing and collecting the most accurate data to represent every demographic and culture, and what sound really is and isn't in hardware and software today. You don't want to miss it. To get in touch with Joan, you can email her at joanpba at gmail.com. Or you can find her as well as all the wonderful Women in Voice information at womeninvoice.wordpress.com. I hope you're enjoying the Sound and Marketing Podcast. Don't forget to follow and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and Stitcher. Reviews, ratings, and shares are all most definitely appreciated. For inquiries on producing and developing your own podcast, or for inquiries on sonic branding and sonic branding consultation availabilities, you can find me at Dreamer Productions. That's D-R-E-A-M-R productions.com, LinkedIn, and Facebook. You can also email me at Gina, J-E-A-N-N-A, at dreamerproductions.com. All links will be provided in the show notes. This episode was produced by Dreamer Productions and hosted, written, and edited by me, Gina Isham. We all make sounds. Let's make them on purpose. Let's make this world of sound more intriguing, more unique, and more and more on brand.